here. So when you're digging through the data, one of only two things happens. You find a problem or you find an opportunity. And then you have a communication problem. You have, you have to communicate what needs to happen because of that. So communication, if you want to move out of the individual contributor role, becoming a communicator of data is going to be very, very important. Well, that, that's, that's exciting. I want to dig into that a little bit because um, so you talked about almost a career progression that you can yeah. get just by digging into data, right? Uh, which then is not the exclusive play of, of analysts or data scientists, but actually, let's say you're a marketing executive, right? Um, are you saying effectively that there is additional career progression that a marketing executive could get if they spent their time, you know, pulling out the insight from the data? Yeah, I, yes. I mean, the, uh, why have the data if we're not actually learning from it, if we're not redirecting our brand, our customers, our employees, like we're collecting data in service of or should be in service of human flourishing, improving our products, improving life for others. And the data is the, the past, right? And we're supposed to use it to project where do we need to go in the future? And that is the role of a leader. It's like in 18 months, I think our Customers are going to be over there. So we need to move from over here to over there. And so in the future, you have to be where your customers are or your business will fail. And so data, a lot of times gives us enough information, but I also contend some of the best decisions I've ever made as a leader, I went against what the data would have projected me to do, right? Okay. And so it's not always, you've got to also be like, you know, that's a data point. That's some data. And then you have to couple it with wisdom, with insights, and just your gut sometimes and make decisions. So, um, yes, it's really important. You know, before there was data, like I used to run my whole company off just financial data. That's the only data we really had. And so I think um, we've somewhat lost that intuitive sense. Even at an exec table now, we'll, we'll say, you know, okay, great. Okay, great. We're going to do this thing. And then someone will go like, do we have data we could find to support the decision? And then everything's like slows down because someone wants data to support it. So I, I do think we have somewhat lost some of that uh, intuitive um, uh, ability to intuit also what we need to do because data doesn't have all the answers every time. Okay, that's that 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 is fascinating. So there's four points there that you you picked up, which I've made notes on because I think they're really really valuable. So I like those three stages that you talked about. Firstly, the individual contributor, and and you're an individual contribu contributor if you're just sort of what sharing some of the or, or finding some of the insights, right? And then you move up to strategic advisor, and then you become a, a leader. And in that package, the foundation is also useful to understand that data doesn't always have the answer. Is that correct? Have I got that hierarchy right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think once you move into leader, uh, you have to operate in what we call the fog. Like it's a little foggy. It's a lot more uncertainty. So to move yeah. up, I think people that start in data, it's very concrete. It's very factual. And as you move yeah. up, it becomes a little more blurry, a little bit more unknown. You're in the unknown a lot. And so it's just that ability to start in the data and then eventually uh, use data partially and then yeah, going into the unknown, there is no data there yet, but you're yeah. using today's data to say, look, this data plotted like this. In the future, we want it to plot like that. What do we, yeah. what do, we do to get in the future so our data looks like this going up instead of how it's going down, right? And then you change the behavior of the people that are generating the data. So like sales team, if sales are going like that, you want them to go like that. So you have to persuasively communicate to the people generating the data that's in a dive what they need to do to make the data go the desired direction in the future. So it's it's communication that's yeah. coupled with the data. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So, you know, some, some companies now, they're blessed with a team of analysts that can help them look through that data. Um, uh, but then there was a point that I think I saw in, in one of your talks where you talked about the fact that Every job now needs for about 70%, I think the number you said. Um, uh, 67% of all jobs 67. are data, data enabled, yeah. Okay, what do you mean by data enabled then? In, in, That's in a that? PWC, it's a PWC study where jobs, like you can't do your job, your job is enabled by data. So uh, like my, even my creative team, their job is enabled by data because they have a billability number and they all know how to, 
to generate and or serve themselves the data they need to do their job. So that's what that means. So my, um, the gal, the CEO who runs my service business, she was a graphic designer, but you know what? She is in the data all the time. About 60% of her job now is looking at the data, slicing the data, and then having conversations about what the data has shown her. Um, So I mean, she was creative. She was a graphic designer and now she's all up in the data. So, yeah. So there's there is uh, there was an interesting I think you said PwC I've seen a McKinsey study that showed um, that companies that have a large percentage of their staff who work with the data outperform companies who have who don't have that same degree of individuals and then I remember I, I was fortunate when I used to work at Just Giving that I had a team that was often headhunted by Facebook and eventually they took two of them um, <laughs> just couldn't com- compete at <laughs> some stage. But one of the interesting things they shared, though, was that everybody, irrespective of the position that they were entering, had to learn how to interrogate data. They spent some time interrogating data. Do you think that's something most companies need to be able to do now and to sort of educate their staff, the wider staff beyond the analysts to start uh, analyzing data or trying to figure out what it's telling them? Big time, big time. Data literacy, if you want to call it. I like the term interrogating the data. That's hysterical. I've not heard that. I mean, it's so funny because we are in a lot of L&D departments of these huge brands. And it's like a do or die for them to learn financial acumen. And, And part of that financial acumen is mostly data. So we're seeing data story as a course coupled with financial acumen. And they're saying this is now the new foundation of work. Because I think it's, it is one thing to interrogate the data, but if you don't understand the cause and effect of it, you know, maybe that's how you interrogate it and you figure that out. Um, but yeah, I, 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 most roles are um, involved data. So okay. sorry you lost some team members though. <laughs> we're, we're still friends we're still friends so it's 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 all good so i'm going to go to the opposite side now of that because we've talked about the fact that everybody needs to pay attention to this so if everyone needs to pay attention to this there is a real dismal stat that points the other way that actually i think it was from forrester or gartner where they say that in most organizations only 25 percent of people will pay attention to any of the data and the insights right which basically means around 70 70 odd percent of people depending on which of the stats you take um, are, have no interest, don't use data, or are feel f- fearful of it. I think you mentioned data literacy as well that gets in the way. Um, mm-hmm. What do you think gets in the way of individuals in, in, engaging with data? You know, well, what, what how do you measure? Way? Like, how do you measure the engagement with the data? Now, with the tool you're building, you probably can see how many looked at it, clicked on it, so you can measure engagement. But right now, it's kind of hard to actually measure. And what is engagement? To me, it's a win. When you have data, you figured out what needs to happen from the data and you move people to do that thing. So they actually took action from the data. So engagement is great. Action is even the next step. And some of those things are less measurable until you see the data actually turn in the direction that you wanted it to go. So um, it's, it's, it's hard to measure unless everyone has the BI tools and everyone has a dashboard and everyone has access to it, um, yeah. but it's not fed to everyone. Um, and then, you know, I think your tool's cool because they can click on it and you know, you know the engagement around it. Just because they read it, though, does that mean they took action? Not everything needs you to take action from it. Um, yeah. Some of it's just need to know. Um, right. But I think that's interesting. I, I don't have the answer to that, really. Okay, okay. Yeah. No. Well, uh, I think we've, um, a lot of our researchers try to understand what, why do people not interact with data? And we find that for a lot of people, it's actually quite overwhelming, right? Um, you know, if, you, if you're just looking at a spreadsheet and you're not an analyst, this isn't your playground. It isn't a place that excites you. It's, it's boring. It's, uh, you know, it's like, what am I going to do with that? And then there's this other thing of... Um, what is this thing actually telling me? There's just a lot of numbers, a lot of graphs, a lot of things in there. Just, you know, it's not really sharing anything with me that can help me address uh, the things that I need to in my job, meet my targets or any of those sort of things, you know? And and unfortunately, analysts are not the greatest 
communicators. I can generalize because I, I, I have been one myself. Um, you know, communication is, is something we, we, we have to learn when sharing something that's, you know, not just interesting, but useful for you to, to act on. But this is where story comes in, Nancy, and, and uh, uh, your, your, the work you've done on data story. Because when I discovered this whole idea of data stories, and I, I went the long way around. I ended up you know, studying um, some work for Donald Miller and um, oh, uh, some movie, movie directors and everything. And I was just like, wow, there is something in this ability to communicate and grab people's attention, which insights don't do, right? They, they're right. not... They're not fun to look at, right? Um, you know, but whereas story, there's something in there that grabs our attention, holds it for a certain period of time. Um, so I'd love to just understand how did you come up with the concept of storytelling in business and, and in data? Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it has a like a long history. My first book was about visuals, like uh, you're too young to remember, but presentation tools used to be really ugly by default. I mean, they were built by engineers with no design skills. So we used to have to just, we had to just really work hard with wizardry and, you know, sleight of hand to just make presentations look decent. So I wrote a book in 2008. Then I started to realize this is not solving the problem because the content itself the, 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 what they were trying to convey was terrible. So it was like putting, making it look attractive was like putting lipstick on a pig. I mean, it was just making something really terrible look a little better. And so, and only so much lipstick can help some people. And so <laughs> that was when I realized, you know what? I know story has the answer because the greatest speeches of all times, I knew, I have a book called the hundred greatest speeches of all times. And I knew that the greatest speeches, the spoken word, had a rhythm and a cadence and a rise and fall. Like I just knew they rose and fall and so does story. And so, and they have a cathartic kind of sense to them. And so I went on a similar journey, looked at the classics, uh, Joseph Campbell, Chris Vogler, all the um, cinematic, all the literature and the different ways, everything from fairy tales to epic tales, just kind of studied it all. And just looked for the patterns and the models that could be applied to business. And, um, and, and that's become my body of work. You, you take one trip through story and you're just never the same. It just really... Yeah. Um, it's a mental model for me now where, where I just always had in my head and it's been powerful. It's been a, a pleasure and humbling. Yeah. Yeah. You know, excellent. I, I, I know I can, I can attest to that. When I discovered story and found a way to apply to analytics, it became like a, a, a secret formula. I could churn yeah. out insights that people were suddenly paying attention to. Um, yeah. You know, it was helping them. And, you know, we went from, Oh, here comes the analytics guys to, to, yeah. to being, you know, I'm looking forward to what we can do today to try and improve whatever it is that yeah. we're working on. So it's a, I'm key. Gonna... it's a key that unlocks minds. It's, Absolutely. it's awesome. Yeah. Like it's crazy awesome. Yeah, I love the way you described it there. So Nancy, um, you've done a lot of work with um, how MRI scans have been done when stories are told and the power of stories. Mm -hmm. But before you go into that, um, we did some digging around and we found a fantastic video where you explain the power of story. I'm going to ask Craig, it's it's only like a four minute video. I'm going to ask Craig to play that real quick. Um, and once he's played that, we can jump into the whole, um, you know, uh, power of story and so forth. Okay, fantastic. Here we go. Stories are a powerful container of information. In fact, cultures, beliefs, lore has been passed down from generation to generation across illiterate generations of humankind. That's how powerful it is. Stories could be repeated, they could be told, they could be passed on even to children and be remembered. What is it about a story? Something happens to a story, our heart races, we lean forward, we're pulsing, we can't wait, we're anticipating, oh my gosh, what's gonna happen next? We're excited, we actually are really engaged and it actually means something to us to share a story with someone. What happens suddenly, we insert a slide in the mix and our communication flatlines. Suddenly it's not interesting, there's no pulse. The slide, something about it becoming a presentation makes our stories sterile. In fact, we're not even using stories. To use a story means you need to be human and you need to put a human sense and, a, and your humanity out on the line for people to judge and people to um, maybe not even take care of the story that you're telling them. And that's kind of scary. There's two basic types of writing. On one extreme is a report. 
A report has, is exhausted. It's got facts. It's got figures. It's got tables and details, and it's just exhausted. So if you work for a large consultancy, let's say, and a client pays you $2 million to do a bunch of research, you're going to build a report for them, for goodness sake, and it better look like a dense report and better have tons of information because they paid you $2 million. And you might even be building that in PowerPoint or some other slide application, and that's fine, but you're building a report. And something happens. We're in report building mode. And then we forget that to convey our research, so we captured our research, but to convey and communicate our research, we need a different creative process to follow than report making and exhaustive research. So we need to do is incorporate more stories. So on the other pole, the other stream of writing is a story. It's basically dramatic writing, cinema, literature follows that form. Those are the two extremes. And what we need to do is presentations fall right in the middle. A presentation has explanatory structure. It's got some facts and figures and information, but it also needs to be married uh, with story, like a cake, little layers of a cake. You need to build in some report-like information and also story structure and story information to keep it interesting. Now, this is a very powerful communication medium. Stories are very sacred in a way, and you can't abuse them either. So what you need to do is fold stories in. Let your humanity kind of hang out there tell stories in a compelling way, and you'll actually change people's beliefs. You'll change their ideas. You'll sway them towards you, just like a great story does. They're engaged. They're wanting to hear from you. There's a big structural difference between a report and a story. So if you look at them in parallel, you'll see that reports have a framework to them and stories have a framework to them. A report framework has a topical information, has data, has facts, whereas a story framework, it has narrative, meaning, story, metaphor. So what you need to do once you've built your presentation is you need to identify places in your presentation where you can turn what would be considered fact or reporting into a story. You can take data and instead of just conveying the data, you can find the meaning and the narrative in the data and tell the story behind the data. So you need to do that throughout the presentation so that it creates a pattern and a rhythm. In Hollywood, they'll only be on a um, scene for three minutes. There will never be a movie scene that lasts longer than three minutes. And that's very important to remember. So you need to mix up a little story with a little information and move it up, change it up, keep it interesting and constantly be changing it up. Mix a little bit of report with a little bit of story and change all of your presentations into wonderful explanations of your idea. Because if you do that, your idea will spread. They'll be chatting about your presentation at the water cooler. They'll be talking about your idea in the next meeting. They'll be saying, did you, did you hear what he said it was unbelievable. And that's what you want. That's how you'll get recognized. It's how your organization will stand out from the competitors. And it's a very powerful tool that has worked for thousands of years. And I know you can use it to work for you. Excellent. Now that, that I, 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 I'm sure you're aware of that video. There's a lot of videos of, on, on YouTube of you talking about the power of story. And I, I think that resonated quite well. Um, so you, you shared in, in, in fact, there's, there's an interesting question on the chat. Are you okay to, to jump to that? Cause I think it relates yeah. to what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So it's from Matt, Matt Stevens. He says, um, what do you do when the exec after having heard a presentation on any form of data, uh, then tries to interrogate it and discredit it because it challenges them in some way. Do you think That's story it. can help with that? Yeah, I think so. Let me see if I can pull up. Uh, um, there's an actual model about what you can do to uh, how executives are measured. And so there might be a probability that you have, let me share my screen real quick. Oh, I can't share. So executives are measured three ways. It's money and it's market and it's exposure. So they're trying to drive those three things up or they're trying to drive those three things down. So money, market exposure. On the money side, they're trying to drive money up because they're driving revenue up or they're driving costs down. For market, they're driving market share up or they're driving time to market down. For exposure, they're driving retention up, retaining clients and employees and stakeholders of all kinds, or trying to drive um, exposure to risk down. Those are the three things they drive up or they drive down. If your uh, presentation or what you're asking them or your recommendation isn't appealing to one of those three things, you're not hitting the nerve about how they're measured. If you're going to highly challenge a decision that, that you've made or, the, or you're proposing something where they're going to be threatened by what you're saying, all of that has to do with the delivery. 
Now, if you didn't anticipate that that was going to happen, that's a big that's a big deal. When approaching an executive, if you didn't have a sponsor, you should run this by a few people first to be like, where where's the reaction going to be? Where am I stepping on a sacred cow? Or where am I, like what am I doing that could could inflame them? And then if people coach you and say, this is going to really make them mad, then what you need to do is shape, is you got to spend some time shaping that narrative in a way where you acknowledge, you know what, I, um, I just want to prepare you. This is going to excite you a little bit. So, and I need that, like as an exec, I'll be like, blah, 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 I get all excited or, or angry or like, what, 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 I get disoriented. I get thrown off my rocker. And the ones who are going to say, I would like to get through my full narrative because I know you're going to react. Uh, let me get through the whole thing and then let's chew on it or let's talk about it. Um, that kind of setup helps more than you would even imagine. Just acknowledging that this might, this could, you know, um, confront or um, confront isn't the right word, but it might throw things back up in your face that you don't want to face. Um, and that'll help, that'll help you. Uh, excellent. Excellent. And it's a shame uh, you couldn't share. Actually, we'll, 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 we'll work on that noted for our, our next webinar, but um, you have that <laughs> displayed as a model. Do you, do you is that, um, oh, okay. Is that something you're willing to share at, at some point perhaps, or, or is it in yeah. a book? In, in yeah, it's in, um, it's in data story and it, yeah, it um, yeah. So it's in data story. Yeah. Excellent. And I think to that point that that uh, the question that Matt raised, it's it's really interesting having studied both. Um, so I'm passionate about behavioral economics and data and, and the interplay yeah. between the two. And often we think of data as purely rational and it doesn't hold any emotion, whereas data is intrinsically connected to emotion. Right. Yeah. So yeah. you imagine if you saw uh, try and convince a Trump supporter that they didn't have the largest inauguration or number of people at the inauguration, you know, when the pictures showed something slightly different, right? Um, and so it's it's because we have emotional connections to a lot of things that sometimes it becomes difficult when that number doesn't look like what we want it to look like, right? So you have that even, well, I have that when I stand on a weighing scale, if the number is not right, I'll get off and then I'll try and stand on it again, right? But if the number is what I want it to be, I'm really happy at that point. And it's really interesting that story has a way of addressing that, um, uh, which I've seen. I got that from your book and as well as some of the uh, research from, from Brent Dykes, because story taps into emotion, whereas a, you know, a standard report doesn't tap into emotion, whereas story really taps into the emotional part. Um, are you able to say a bit more about how story and emotions come together? Yeah, then it, it is interesting. And I, I uh, you touched on, on the brain science, how we can hook up a fMRI machine. That wasn't mm -hmm. my research, by the way. It was like research that's being done at MIT and all these other. I don't have that big of a lab. I wish I did. <laughs> I wish I had an fMRI machine. But um, <clears throat> the human brain is wired for story. Like you actually can see stories. Uh, it lights up all the sensing parts of the brain but also the storyteller, the story listener, our brains are lighting up in the same exact pattern. So that aligns our emotions when we're sharing a story. And then story also suspends the analytical and critical nature of our brain and kind of transports us and makes us open to uh, new ideas. And it also uh, releases um, the love hormone, right? And it floods our, our bodies with affection for someone else. So those are really powerful physiological things happening and you can't control them. They're physiologically happening and your brain is firing, your heart is pumping out, you know? And um, so harnessing this thing that's already wired into our brain to help someone understand what we're trying to convey is is just brilliant. Like, you know, we, we need to just harness what's already wired into us. Um, and so shaping, it's not that big of a mystery. I mean, like the classic, the classic tip is structure everything in a three act structure, you know, act one, act two, act three, like it's like classic things like that, that are just framing devices. It's not like you, it's not like I'm saying, oh, go do some fiction and some spin and, you know, make stuff up. That's not what this is. It's just, it's a, it's structure your content in a logical three act way, like, you know, and it makes things clearer. If you know what to put in the first, second and third act, you have solved a really big problem. So I don't, did uh, that answer uh, that, where you were wanting me to go? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I oh, think cool. it's, um, so yeah, I think the, the where you started as well, where you talked about um, 
you know, the, the story lighting up every part of the brain. When yeah. you sit in a presentation or in a, a, a lecture, you know, there's only two parts of the brain that light up, the Wernicke's and the Broca's area. And, and <laughs> the trouble with that is that it doesn't stimulate memory, right? And yeah. we need memory. The brain likes to do what it remembers. And uh, if, if it's only those two areas lit up, you don't remember yeah. as much, you know? So, and I think you had something really interesting from uh, Chip and... Uh, yeah, Chip um, and Dan Heath, yeah. That's right. What was that piece of insight that you... That yeah, you they did all this research at Stanford where they gave um, the students statistics and then they stood up and half the students just presented the statistics and the other half wrapped them in the shape of a story. And like 5% remembered the statistics themselves and 67% remembered the statistics that were shared in the form of a story. So it's, I mean, it's pretty <laughs> persuasive. So if it's about recalling it and remembering what was said, you wrap it in the shape of a story and it's more memorable. And that that's huge. Imagine all the data we're sharing with executives right now. Um, I know right. some people on, on the call are analysts and um, some of them have companies themselves that 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 produce insight that um, they share with executives. Just showing them the stats means that only 5% of them will retain any of that information. Yeah, right? it kind of it. depends. Sure. Like right. I, all of our work is also rooted in empathy. So okay. you got to know your exact. So I have a client who's like, People get all these fancy BI tools, want to plot all these gooey, you know, shimmery, lickable charts and stuff. He's like, I don't want to see any of that. You better show me a table and it better be in two colors, black or red. If you're going to present to him, you better give him a table in black or red, right? Because you're, because that means you didn't listen. You didn't care how he processes information, da, da, da. So a lot of it too. So, you know, what, what I say is true, but like, not for everybody. You got to know um, if you're not like empathetically walking in their shoes, really trying to understand them, um, th then then your communication will fail, right? So make sure you understand how they like to have information. Some like a report. I like a three page slide doc. You send it to me ahead of time. You know, put as much in there as you want. I could read that fast, and then let's when we meet, let's have a conversation. And all my execs and my team knows that. You're going to come to Nancy. She will show up having read what your topic is. Then we can talk about where the gaps are. We can spend time talking about, hey, you said this. I think that let's reconcile, um, you know, in service of decision making. So, so no, you just, you need to know how they communicate. Excellent. So yeah. let's get into, let's get into a bit of how. You talked about the three act structure. I'm dyslexic. Right. So writing isn't my strength, which is why it took me about three years to write my book. And I wrote it seven times over um, before I discovered lots of people have ghostwriters, which I wish I'd done at the, at the beginning. Um, and so how does someone like myself or anybody really, you know, use that structure that you've talked about um, to easily articulate the points that they need to make from that data as a story or, you know, to influence and and get change on the back of that? Yeah, I, I, it's um, in data stories specifically, I, I, framing and shaping things in a three act structure, just need to know what the three acts are. So act one is usually the beginning and it's, there's this likable person. And act two is they encounter all these roadblocks, they struggle, they're, um, you know, they do a car chase, they lose the girl, a big monster shows up. Like the, the bulk of movies, believe it or not, or the met, what we call the messy metal. It's like, I'm encountering all these roadblocks. And then the third act is they're changed because of um, the messy metal. And so I could like read to you kind of a single classic data story. And this will be super simple, super simple data that, you know, is way less um, complex than the data I'm sure the people on this call work on. So um, <clears throat> in a data story, the first act where it's the beginning is you're stating this is our current state. So it's um, the beginning of a story is our, I found a problem or an opportunity in the data and this is what it was. And then act two is the data to support this is negative or positive. In other words, it's like, Data is headed this way, but should be headed this way, or it's super positive and we have an opportunity. So that's act two. Act three is therefore we need to take action. We need to do these things so we have a positive resolution to this story, and it works every time. So it's it's um, in the book. It's really crisp, and it's and it can be three sentences. It could be an executive summary at the front of something where it's like 
this is what's happening. This is what the data says the problem opportunity is. To do it, we need to transform the numbers like this, and then we need to take this particular action. This is what my friend would text to the CEO, three little sentences. And once you're trusted, you can make these, they, they, your recommendations can get shorter and shorter and shorter. When you're first starting, you may make recommendations. You may, if you work for a consultancy, right, you may have that 80 page thing, and then you may have 300 pages in your appendix just to show how smart you are. Um, and I highly recommend that. Um, but you can craft sentences in there, like your key idea, your key point, or your headline should be, sh could be shaped in the shape of a data story. So the takeaway is so clear every time of what yeah. they're supposed to perceive from the data. So, so let me try one with you, right? So let's say the, the uh, problem of the opportunity, we've, we've had uh, uh, a significant increase in sales, um, uh -huh. uh, which means we're going to hit, uh, which means we, we should be back on track for our targets, right? So that's the, that's the problem. That's the thing that grabs their attention and makes them pay attention to the rest of the story, right? Gives us permission to say a bit more. Uh, the next one is, um, is why, right? So I'm guessing the data to support this is, is the same as in our framework. We call it the climax, right? So the first one was the hook. Let's get you interested. Grab you, grab your attention. Now we take you on that journey towards the climax. And the climax really is, 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 um, we saw the increase because uh, our social channels, we had a massive increase from Facebook as a social channel because um, a, uh, uh, an influencer posted something about our product, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and then the action, which was the third bit that you said, so that's, uh -huh. this is where we make it actionable. Um, and rather than re increase brain cycles for the, the reader to say, what should I do about that? We actually give a recommendation and yeah. we say things like, hey, um, uh, see, you might want to invest in uh, more posts from the social, uh, um, if you like, the influencers that are on our, um, that we've partnered with, yeah. right? So Therefore, we need to find more influencers, right? Usually right. the third right. act starts with something like, therefore, we need therefore. to, yeah. So like right. act one could be, I, did, I have one too. It's like act one, our warehouses, our warranties are letting customers cancel shipments already in transit. That was found in the data. Our warranties are letting them cancel partway while they're in transit. Act two, now we own regional warehouses to store unreturned parts and it's costing us $8 million a year. Therefore, we need to reduce our costs by rerouting parts back into sellable inventory, right? So it's it's like, this has happened, this has happened, therefore we need to. And the action is what you're, if we're not really explicit in the action to the exact or the action in our recommendation, people won't really know what you're asking from the data. Um, and so, yeah, what your example was, very good. Therefore we need to double down on our spend at Facebook or whatever. Okay, excellent. Yeah. We've had another question in the chat. Um, uh, I'm cool. gonna uh, read that out. What's your view on the Barbara Minto excuse me, Barbara Minto pyramid approach to storytelling. I love her work. Um, our, the way that it's all framed is very different. Um, so um, she has, um, uh, so she has a, not a tree, what does she call it? So she has main point, sub point, supporting points and all of that. And mine is, uh, so there's the tree concept, which is, uh, different because in my work, I add why in there, because if you're not explaining why we need to do it, it's not influential. It's just a report. Um, and then um, she does have three steps and I don't remember the order of them, but ours is different and it's completely focused on data and it's a story framework. Um, I can't, I don't, I'm moving, obviously moving everything from the office. So normally in my office, her book is right behind me on the shelf. So I just don't have it right in front of me. Um, it is different and I massively admire her work. Um, yeah. But our, mine's based in story structures and hers is, um, I think, I think based on her first logic. Is, yeah, so it's key, um, key message, I think it is. Uh, uh -huh. That's the answer. And then uh, supporting arguments which is what i think you were talking about and then um supporting i i may i may have butchered it but i remember it's something being something something i should probably just a key it. message some call it a key insight and it's interesting all of the because we've worked with all the um consulting firms and some think oh you put the key message as the title others put a like a a little colored box at the bottom and think you make it as a summary, something you leave with. Like everyone kind of expresses it a little bit different, but a key yeah. insight is 
you know, the recommendation is what I think. At least it either has to lead with it in the executive summary or summarize with what the recommendation is. Because so often, consult and a lot of times that's crossing a line for consultancies. So some of them are just asked, tee it all up for me. We'll make our decisions. Um, but uh, some, you know, do become full recommendations of a direction to do. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, so I hope, uh, let's see who asked that question. That was a great question. I love her work. Love Holly her work. Houston. Yeah. Uh, some really interesting story arcs that are available, you know, if we go back all the way from, uh, you know, in the in some of the, the, the Greek authors who ta taught us how to write Greek uh, tragedies and Brent Dykes yeah. has his own framework as well that he talks about. You know, um, and I think that they're, they're all the, the news when you read the news, they also have their own, which is sort of the upside down pyramid that they that they approach that they use. Um, I think it's quite interesting. One of the approaches we take is that we look at executives of being really, really time poor. So the, the 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 key key insight has to be really, really clear, really crisp. But it also has to speak to their, you know, the, the key part of the Maslow hierarchy, which is why should I why should I care? Right. Yeah. Why, why do I need to even care about this? And it also needs to answer the why, because that's a natural, natural question that we end up um, uh, asking ourselves. So we 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 have uh, about five minutes before we jump into opening up to the audience. Um, so I have one more uh, question to ask you in this space. It's uh, uh, around the benefits. You talked about there's a few things that you said as you were speaking. Right. So stories build trust. Right. Um, uh, once you've built trust, then you, you sort of get that permission uh, from your executives. They want to hear more from you and you can um, deliver shorter messages. Stories also help you with your career progression, which was something we saw earlier that you spoke about. Um, any other benefits that you can share that story can give to either the inside or an individual? Well, um, they help make decisions quicker, like the right. tighter, clearer you are, it helps make decisions quicker. You know, it helps the individual, helps the organization, ultimately can help the world. You look at something like an inconvenient truth, right? It was data and then his personal story, data, personal story. Like he, his data, he kept really like clean, but then yes. it was not a good movie without knowing, oh my God, his sister died. Oh my God. You know, so it, there's just different ways to incorporate stories, especially anyone working in nonprofit, anyone working in the bottom of the pyramid that really needs to um, convey. And one of the things that's in the fourth section of data story that I love, and that's like, how do you find the people, the data points in the data and know them and understand mm -hmm. them? And how do you humanize them in a way? You know, and I think um, I love how Scott Harrison at Charity Water does this, right? He goes to okay. the people who are getting fresh water at the well, you know, and features their story about how their whole life is transformed. Well, they're just one point of data in this whole thing. So, so humanizing the data is really important. And the other thing I would say is make it relatable. You know, we we understand scale because we have a hand, we have an arm that's so big, we're looking through the eyes. We understand distance because we get in a car and we drive a certain mile per hour. So these, there's certain things in our real world that are very relatable. So as you're trying to convey data and you're trying to say and say, get your head around what I'm trying to say, you can compare it by saying that would be this high if you stacked them all up and you're like, oh my gosh, that's four-story building. I have a four-story building downtown. I know how big that is. Like you, you got to make it so people can get their head around some of the numbers and comparing it to something that's very relatable to the human form is a smart way to do that too. So those are other kind of standout tips for. Excellent. Excellent. And of course, data story does one of the, the, the big things that every organization is striving for, which is to become a data-driven or a data-enabled organization. When you have stories, more people will engage with data. And, and therefore, when more people engage with data, the company can experience better decision-making, as you said, much quicker, more effective, more efficient, because it really brings in all parts of the brain. It also brings other people into the conversation. Uh, yeah. You know, it's far more accessible. And I think in a uh, we we have our developer used to work at ASOS and he was part of the conversion funnel and um, but he was a developer huh. and was never included in any of the reporting or the analysis of what that what was going on with conversion yet how, all his work was to change that so while people are sitting there sweating around why conversion changed he probably had the answer but stories have a way of bringing people in you know. Um, 
So I think that's uh, that's great. Should we uh, open up to the audience right now? Um, yeah, that'd be amazing. Uh, anybody yeah. has any additional questions? Um, please unmute yourself and uh, ask away. We we've heard questions from Matt and Ollie so far. Thank you for those questions coming through in the chat. Um, any other questions? Oh, Craig is unmuting you right now. There we go. Oh, great. I've seen some some people that I that I know. Um, let's have a look. Okay, great. So um Nancy, as we're waiting to see if anyone is brave enough to ask a ask a ask a question, um, or maybe we you've answered all of them. Uh, it it might be great. Have you got anything else? Exhausted that you think and that, exhausting, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got anything else that you think you should you should share around around story that we might have missed? Uh, any key points that you think are really useful for? Um, readers, I, I would recommend everyone get the book, by the way. I think it's an absolutely fantastic book and essential reading um, for anybody who is uh, working with any executive, because whether you're an analyst or not. So I think it's really important. Actually, I have one point. Um, visual, visualization. We haven't touched on that much at all. Wow. Um, how necessary in that is in is that in story? Because we've actually talked with three sentences. We're talking about narrative, but what about visuals? Yeah. And this is where uh, people might start dropping off the call because I did a, some provocative research. I took thousands of slides that were used for conveying conversations and, and meaning and trying to get a recommendation. And I, I, I wanted to make the chart chooser of all chart choosers. I wanted to be the one that said, in this situation, always use a bubble graph. In this situation, like at every kind of fancy new chart, in this kind of situation, use this to communicate so that decisions can be made faster. And in all of that research, we found that the fastest visual way to communicate is through comparison, meaning, line, bar, or, or pie chart, some sort of an area way to convey it. And I was disappointed. I thought I was going to have this breakthrough body of work where it was like going to be the mother of all <laughs> chart choosers, right? And yeah. so then when you start to look at how do you communicate around it, there's not a lot of, there's no tool out there that once you've plotted your chart, you overlay the meaning on top of it like how do you label the thing that you've drawn conclusions about how do you annotate on top of that so the book has a taxonomy for annotation and there's never been one of those either where it'll show you if you're trying to do this like annotate it like that make it clear like that and so there's a whole um, section in there too about how you talk the degrees of adverbs you would use to try to describe the shape and trajectory of a line or the shape that your um, bar charts are making. So it's all, it's all, it, it, the visual part in there was, um, when I say it, it sounds so unprofound, but yet it was really profound. <laughs> well, <laughs> and I, I do I, a better job making a case for it in the book. <laughs> I think, um, and I can't remember whether it was your book or a talk, but there's a lot of science behind why you're, 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 you ended up with just those charts, right? Because say, for example, the brain um, really struggles to see angles. Hence, pie charts can be really difficult when you're doing you know, some of those sort of things. Pie charts become difficult because the brain can't really look at those quantities correctly. I'm, I might be butchering that a little bit, but there's, there's an issue there. Uh, right, and, and the point of a, a pie chart isn't like get this exact number accurate. It's like, this is the biggest. And that's the yeah. only point you need to make. It's like, well, this is way bigger than that, you know? Yeah. So that's where you only would use pie charts under certain circumstances, right? But the, yeah. our brain knows how to process this is bigger or smaller than that when we look at an area. But I'm telling you, a circle, an area is impossible almost to calculate with accuracy that this is exactly 47.8%. Like it's not even the purpose of it. You would never use a pie chart if the numbers needed to be known. You wouldn't even use a line chart. If you wanted them yeah. to actually with accuracy figure out where exactly the number is, you would absolutely use a line chart every time. So it's it's definitely in the book of why and when, because I was anti-pie chart when I went in. I'm like, for sure, pie yeah. charts, I'm going to make the list. Not even going to make the list. 
And then I went pretty deep into the research that's been done about how much people gain from just visually knowing that this is gargantuan. You'd never use a pie chart that has a hundred sections. It's only if you have two or three things and you're yeah. comparing them. So yeah. I, I was way anti-pie chart when I started this and then wound up feeling like, wow, there's a lot of research that shows it actually works right. in the right circumstance, right? With the right audience, yeah. it works. Yeah, yeah. You, you have to convince me because I'm still anti-pie chart. Um, yeah. uh, <laughs> I, I haven't crossed that, that line yet.